Hi, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another webinar from the Philips Lighting University. Today's webinar is titled Biomimicry Design Inspired by Nature, and it will be presented to you by Michael Paulin, who is the Director and Practicing Architect at Exploration Architecture. What I find working as an architect, uh, now that the idea of environmental sustainability has been very widely accepted, I find that there are often two sentiments expressed. Uh, the first is a question about what's coming next. And the second one is a slight sense of dissatisfaction with the word sustainable. And uh, I think the uh, CEO of the Rocky Mountains Institute, a guy called Amory Lovins, captures this very well when he says, um, imagine if you were to ask one of your best friends, how's your relationship with th your partner? Uh, and they were to say, well, you know, it's sustainable. You'd probably say, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, there's something about the word sustainable that implies a situation that is just about bearable, just about good enough. And I think for both of those questions, biomimicry has a lot of solutions. I think it will show what's coming next in terms of environmental innovation. And I think it'll help us move beyond the paradigm of sustainability to what I would call a restorative or regenerative paradigm. So rather than just being about mitigating negatives, it'll actually be about optimizing positives. So I'm going to tell you what I mean by biomimicry uh, in a few minutes. And it, essentially, I think it's going to be one of the best sources of inspiration that will help us address some of the key challenges of the next few decades. And within this talk, there are some examples of, of, of light in biology and a project that has used uh, light as one of the main drivers of the architectural form. So the, uh, probably the best uh, known example of biomimicry is Velcro. And this uh, was actually inspired by the burrs, the seed burrs on a particular plant. And it was invented by a guy called George de Mestral. He took his dog for a walk one day into the woods and the dog came out with all these uh, seed burrs all over its fur. So George de Mestral took one of these home and he looked at it under a magnifying glass. And this is roughly what he saw. And it was this that inspired him to develop a new type of uh, fastening that was an alternative to zips. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, very widely used today. And looking further back, it's quite likely that um, some of the earliest architectural examples of biomimicry uh, were the um, inspiration taken from shells, seashells and, and bird shells. Um, we know from architectural historical records that Brunelleschi, the architect for the Duomo uh, Cathedral in Florence, he uh, looked at bird shells quite a lot in helping to design the, the lightest and thinnest possible dome. And what we have now uh, is much better scientific knowledge. So if you look, look at it under, if you look at that abalone shell under a, an electron microscope, this is what you would see. It's made up out of thin layers of calcium carbonate disks. And these are connected together by a flexible protein mortar. So at a chemical level, this is 95% uh, identical to ordinary blackboard chalk. But because of this microstructure and the small amount of flexibility that it creates, it achieves 3,000 times the strength of ordinary blackboard chalk. And that gives some indication of what we could achieve if we could learn to make things the way that nature does. And if we could solve other problems, if we could uh, learn from nature's processes and systems, then we could really start to address uh, some of the uh, key challenges of, of the coming era in which we're going to have to use uh, far less energy, uh, use resources much more efficiently, and so on. And sometimes uh, biomimicry inventions have quite interesting starting points. So th this one I'm going to describe, uh, this, the starting point for this was uh, a marine biologist whose genuine name is Dr. Frank Fish. And he was looking at humpback whales one day and he noticed that the, the fronts of the flippers, they have these uh, lumps on the front edge. They're called tubercles. And it turns out that those actually help with the hydrodynamics. So humpback whales swim in quite tight, slow circles. 
and these lumps on their flippers help maintain maneuverability at slow speed. And what Dr. Fish did is he thought, well, that could actually be a big benefit in wind turbines. Uh, because what normally happens with wind turbines is when the wind slows down, the turbine stops turning and then the wind speed has to pick up a lot in order for the wind uh, turbine to start turning again. So Dr. Fish invented this new wind turbine blade with lumps along the front edge and uh, it's claimed that this can increase the output of the wind turbine by as much as 15% over the course of each year because it stays operational for a longer period of time. There are some pretty amazing examples of, of light in biology, um, mainly examples of bioluminescence, such as these fungi and uh, these ones. And generally, this is um, a symbiotic relationship between the organism and uh, microorganisms that produce the, the light effect. There are some organisms that can also diffuse light very effectively. So this is called the cluster wink snail and it's evolved to diffuse light throughout its shell. So the light source is, a, is again bioluminescent bacteria, but the shell has evolved to actually diffuse the light all through it. Then there are some quite well-known examples like fireflies and, and some really quite remarkable examples like uh, squid. Now, squid have uh, skin that is able to change not just their color, but also their texture. And it does it in a, a very energy efficient way because it, it just flips between states. So in order to maintain color, it's not continually having to put um, energy into that. And there have been some uh, audiovisual companies that have uh, put a lot of research work into uh, Squid in order to develop much more energy efficient uh, display systems. One of my favorite examples of uh, lighting design, if you could call it that in biology, is the glass sponge. So these are quite amazing uh, organisms that live in quite deep sea conditions. And they have evolved these skeletons uh, that uh, are made up out of fibers. And some of those fibers are actually optical fibers with higher optical quality than man-made optical fibers. And the ones at the bottom actually uh, go down into the seabed to anchor it to the seabed. And what you can see here, these, these are the fibers down towards the end here. And above the seabed, they have a smooth surface. And then below the seabed, they have this barbed surface so that it's anchoring it to the seabed. And then right at the end of this, it has this termination that look like, looks like this. And each of these things here is a little lens which focuses bioluminescent light into this fiber optic tube and it, it actually illuminates the, the whole glass sponge. And the theory is that it does this in order to attract food uh, to, to the, the glass sponge. So it has a symbiotic relationship with bioluminescent bacteria. So in summary, uh, Biomimicry it draws on an amazing source of solutions. And it, so these are proven solutions in biology. And these, I believe, are going to help us address the three really big challenges of the next uh, few decades. And as, as I see it, these are firstly achieving radical increases in resource efficiency, so doing far more with far less resource. Secondly, shifting from a linear way of using resources to a closed loop model. So, uh, shifting to a system in which all resources are stewarded within closed loop cycles. And then finally making the shift from a fossil fuel economy to a solar economy. And if we choose to embark on those three interlinked journeys, then in my opinion, there is no better source of solutions than biomimicry. And you could look at nature as being like a source book of ideas that have all benefited from a 3.8 billion year research and development period. And to make things even better, all the faulty, faulty products have been withdrawn from the marketplace. So now uh, turning to some projects that uh, have used this uh, form of innovation. The Eden project was one that I worked on from the very early stages through to completion. And uh, for those of you who don't know, this is, I believe, still the biggest greenhouse in the world. And we had a pretty challenging site. Uh, this was the site before we started building. It's a, a China clay quarry. So quite deep, about 90 meters deep with quite unstable surfaces. 
And we started by analyzing the sun path diagram, finding which parts of the sites had the, the longest sunshine hours. And then we conceived of the building as being like a, a string of bubbles. So the diameter of those bubbles could be varied to provide the right growing heights in the different parts of the building. And then what we called the necklace line, which joins all those together, that could be varied to suit the shape of the site. So it was really quite an irregular site, but by choosing this uh, geometry inspired by soap bubbles and other biological organisms, we were actually able to fit into the sites uh, very effectively. And you can probably just see this line running around the bubble model. Now that is the intersection line between the bubbles and the 3D terrain model. So we played about with these bubble models, setting them into the terrain, and then by cutting away everything that was below ground, we ended up with the, the first image that looks something like the completed building. The challenge then was how to design this structure in the lightest way possible, um, so that, what, well, partly so that we could save on steel, but also so that we could get as much light into the building. And um, in order to design that in the most efficient way possible, we looked at lots of examples of biological structures, in, in, such as this one, this is a pollen grain, we looked at marine microorganisms like these, radiolaria, and um, even carbon molecules. There is a type of carbon molecule that's referred to as a Buckminster fullerene um, after the famous engineer that came up with the geodesic structure. So that proved to be the, the most efficient way to enclose this building. And then what we wanted to do was to make each of those individual hexagons as large as possible. And to do that, we had to find an alternative to glass so we used ETFE, which is a high strength polymer. And the way that you use this is you put it together in three layers and then you weld it around the edge and you inflate it. And it's the inflation that gives it the strength to span really big distances. So these are about, the, the largest hexagons here are about 70 square meters, which is far larger than you can make glass. And what's more, this was only 1% of the weight of double glazing. So that was a, a factor 100 saving in terms of resources. And what we found is that we got into a positive cycle in which one breakthrough facilitated another. So with such large lightweight pillows, it meant we had less steel. With less steel, we were getting more sunlight into the building. And with more sunlight, it meant we didn't have to put as much additional heat in during the colder times of the year. And at the end of the project, I worked out that the weight of this superstructure was actually <coughs> excuse me, lighter than the weight of the air inside the building. And if we were to do this again with slightly better building technology, learning further lessons from nature, I'm very confident that we could take that steel weight down by a factor of another four. And the main way that we would do that would be to uh, learn from nature by putting the material exactly where it needs to be. So rather than making steel tubes that are exactly the same wall thickness and diameter all the way along, we would make steel tubes which are wider in the middle and tapered towards the end. Now, conventionally, that has been much more expensive and complicated, but now that 3D printing is really starting to make progress, there will be no cost penalty in achieving complexity. In actual fact, if we do what biology does, which is create very complex forms like this, that put the material exactly where it needs to be, it should end up cheaper because we will use less material and we will produce a more efficient structure. So the Eden project was very successful and um, it's continued to be run by a great guy called uh, Tim Schmidt. He was our client and he actually came from a bit of a showbiz uh, background. Uh, so he was fantastic at um, really creating a, a sense of occasion and creating events at the Eden Project, often using really dramatic lighting, this time working with a lighting designer called Bruce Munro. So the next project I want to talk about is an office building. Uh, so this was an opportunity for us to apply biomimicry to a much more conventional building. The, the Eden Project was very much a, a one-off. The office building uh, is quite a conventional building type, and we wanted to demonstrate that we could use biomimicry to really push the agenda of uh, uh, super efficient office buildings. And we gathered together a team of some of the best consultants we could find, and we insisted on having a really good biologist as part of the team. 
the client um, was happy with that. They let us uh, get on with it. And um, in the first workshop, one of the conclusions we came to was that uh, daylight was likely to be one of the biggest drivers of the architectural form. And that's partly because we wanted to uh, save energy, but also because we wanted this to be a, a very healthy building for the occupants. And um, with our biologist, we started looking at examples of light gathering in biology. So um, what I'm drawing here, uh, this is one of the organisms that our biologist told us about. This is a spookfish. And spookfish have these amazing mirror-shaped structures uh, which can focus very low levels of bioluminescence coming up from the ocean. Uh, a second one that we looked at is called the stone plant. So the stone plant is a plant that lives in desert regions. And for reasons of thermal stabilization, most of the plant is below the ground. And then the photosynthetic matter is down in what you could call the basement. And it has a roof light that allows the light to come down uh, to the basement where the chemical reactions can take place at a very steady temperature. Another one we looked at is called a brittle star. So these are starfish that live as much as 500 meters below the ocean surface where light levels are very low. And they have evolved a covering of near optically perfect lenses over their skin. So the brittle star is able to focus very, and detect very small amounts of light and movement and it can see predators long before they see it. So how did we use that in the building itself? Well, um, a fairly conventional way of designing for light in office buildings is to just think about the right distance between the window walls. And in London, you can often find office buildings that are as much as 25, 30 meters deep and you know that those are going to be high energy buildings because they'll be uh, artificially lit, um, air conditioned and so on. So what's the right dimension? Well, we concluded that the right dimension was about 12 meters. So no one was further than six meters from the nearest window. And then thinking about what kind of building form this might suggest, one approach would be to just take these narrow floor plates and stack them up into a tower. And that would be fine if we were dealing with dense urban locations with high land values. We wanted to create something more universal than that. So we looked at two other building forms. One was a ring of office space around a, a central atrium. And then the other was a more linear approach where we formed these two linear blocks of office floors with a linear atrium down the middle. And it, it was that one, that last one that seemed to work best when we were analyzing the light levels. I'm just choosing the next animation. Here we go. OK. So analyzing the light levels with daylight software, what we found is that we were getting this curved pattern of shading uh, towards the middle of each uh, uh, floor. So the next move was to simply bend those floor plates so, so they would follow the pattern of light, and we get a very even quality of light all the way along. This produced two further challenges. Firstly, narrow floor plates aren't very good for creative clusters of people. You need some places with uh, wider floors. And secondly, this wasn't making very efficient use of a rectangular site. And we were likely to end up with, um, uh, with a rectangular site. So then learning uh, from ideas of surface area to volume optimization, we elaborated the plan form into this undulating plan. So we still had no point further than six meters from the nearest window. But now we're getting much better facilities for creative clusters of people, and we are making more efficient use of a rectangular site. And then still looking at uh, light, and particularly daylight, uh, but now looking at the building in section, uh, we found it was reasonably easy to get enough light into the upper parts of the building. The challenge was to how to get light further down. So we explored the possibility of harvesting light from near the top of the building and focusing that into fiber optic tubes. And for this, we looked at a rainforest plant called Anthurium waraquinum, which lives in very low light levels. And it's evolved lenses all over its leaves, which focus, somehow they focus diffuse light. And that's become a research project, uh, which we hope to bring in to the next stage of the project. So we concluded that there was a good case for shaping the building 
And inspired by the Spookfish, we incorporated a, a large-scale mirror into the atrium that would bounce light deeper into the lower parts of the building. And then thinking about what we would do underneath that mirror, we thought this was a great opportunity to create a really dramatic meeting space uh, that would add value to the building. And uh, if I had more time, I'd love to tell you how we learned from termites to design a, a passive heating and cooling system for the building, how we learned from folding leaves and folding beetle wings to design a sun shading system that would let in exactly the right amount of light and convert all surplus light to electricity, and how we learned from curved shells and leaf forms to design a new glazing system which should achieve a roughly 50% saving in glass. This is a model of how the scheme looks now. Uh, so you can see many of the ideas that I talked about, uh, the form driven by daylight, uh, that's the Spookfish light reflector in the middle, and you may just be able to make out uh, the curved forms of the glazing that use very thin glass to form uh, strong uh, glass elements that can span from floor to floor. And then this is a computer generated image of the atrium with the the Spookfish meeting room, and these are the mirrors that bounce light into these lower floors. So you can see there that um, it's perfectly possible to create a, a really well-lit, uplifting building that is the opposite of the, the gloomy, gas-guzzling buildings that uh, we build too often, certainly in London. Now, office buildings have been getting more energy efficient. And where things have been getting worse is in IT. So IT energy consumption has been going up and up. And often you have servers in office buildings like this, and, and those servers are air conditioned, or sometimes you have data centers in cities, and those have to be cooled as well. And um, that, that is a very big part of the energy consumption. So this next project, the Mountain Data Center, this is a concept for a new type of data center um, inspired by biomimicry. And uh, the first move here was uh, to do what animals would probably do when they want to keep cool. Um, they don't have access to intense forms of energy, so generally they just have to change their behavior. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of going somewhere that is cool. So the first move here was to locate the data center in, in a location that is already very cold. In this case, it's a mountain in Norway that has already been carved out for marble mining. And it's got about 90 kilometers of tunnels that are all at a steady temperature of about 5 degrees centigrade. So then the challenge was how do we draw that free source of cool air through the building in the most efficient way possible? And for this, we looked at branching systems in biology, which all seem to follow uh, the mathematical principle that is referred to as Murray's law. So Murray's law uh, defines the ratio between the parent and the daughter vessels, the, the relative diameters. There also seems to be a very constant angle at which the branching occurs. And then these junctions have a certain finessing. So overall, this appears to be an evolved minimum energy solution. And rather than laying the individual data blocks out in long straight lines, which is what the engineers had assumed on the, this project previously, we propose they would be clustered in circles to reduce the pipe length. And then we used Murray's law to uh, design that branching system uh, so that it would draw that cool air through in the most efficient way. Now, that image that you're looking at, that might look, that might look uh, very biological, but it's not that way just because we like biological forms. It's that way because we're trying to design the theoretically perfect solution. And uh, this is how the, the central showcase server would look. And it does have a bit of a James Bond-like quality to this project because, uh, first of all, you'll need to come in through a, a laser scanner that scans your body for security reasons. Then you have to go down this long tunnel. Then you get into a boat to cross an underground lake to travel to the central cavern where the showpiece server is. And then there'll be shafts uh, uh, cut up through the mountain that take the warm air away uh, to a disused quarry near the top where the client wants to build a, a mini version of the Eden project. Now, those ideas of efficient flow, we've taken those a bit further um, on this project. So this is um, 
a biological algorithm that we created, we were asked to get involved in a water treatment facility. It was a tender for a big new water treatment facility in Qatar. And the scheme that we were shown didn't look that efficient because it, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of space between the individual elements and also the, the layout was very rectilinear. And we thought there might be scope to learn from um, the Murray's law optimization in biology. So we created this biological algorithm, which starts with a hypothetical layout of elements. And then the algorithm just optimizes the relative positioning of these elements together with optimizing the, the branching system. And if you look at the figures at the bottom, you can see that the total length of pipework comes down to about 60% of the starting point. And um, here's a, a second one, which uh, it optimizes in, in a slightly different form, but again, the, the length comes down to uh, below 65% of the starting point. So it would be a, a much more energy efficient system. And interestingly, both end up looking quite biological, but that's the result of following biological principles rather than just following biological uh, shapes. So the next project that I want to talk about in a way is also to do with light. Uh, so this is the Sahara Forest Project. And um, you, know, you could look at the world's deserts as being um, partly failed systems uh, because many of the world's deserts were actually created by humans. Um, or you could look at them as a fantastic opportunity. So the, the world's deserts have an excess of light and if we could manage that light in a, a better way, it could actually go a long way towards solving our energy challenges in other parts of uh, Europe and other parts of the world. So it's pretty easy to look up how much energy the world receives every year. And we receive about 7,000 times as much energy from the sun as we use currently in energy from all forms. So if we could capture some of the energy that falls on the world's deserts, then we could conduct that around uh, the, our continents using high voltage uh, DC grids. So I mentioned there that a lot of the world's deserts were vegetated a fairly short time ago. And that's certainly true of North Africa because when Julius Caesar arrived, what he found was a wooded landscape of cedar trees and cypress trees. And um, his armies set about uh, cutting down those forests to create intensive farms. And for about 200 years, that did actually uh, produce a lot of grain for the Roman Empire. But after that point, they realized that they had substantially trashed the landscape. Uh, they'd lost nearly all its fertility. Uh, the minerals had been washed out into the sea. And also, they had substantially changed that climate. Previously, it was quite a plentiful rainfall regime. When the Romans had finished, it was basically a desert with very little rainfall. And I just need to find the next animation. Uh, here we go. So this one shows photosynthetic activity around the world over the course of a number of years. And what you can see is that the boundaries of the deserts actually shift back and forth quite a lot over the course of each year. So if we were to look at some of those boundary conditions to the deserts, then what we thought was that if we could intervene at some of those boundary locations, then maybe we could halt or even reverse desertification. And um, if, you're, if you're into biomimicry and um, you're working in an extreme location, then there's a lot that you can learn from the organisms that are already adapted to life there. So this is one of the heroes of biomimicry and certainly a hero for this project, this is the Namibian fog basking beetle, which has evolved a way of harvesting its own fresh water in a desert. So what it does is it comes out of its hiding place at night, it crawls to the top of a sand dune, and because it's got this matte black shell and it's lightweight, it's able to radiate heat out to outer space and become slightly cooler than its surroundings. And then when the moist breeze blows in off the sea, you get these droplets of water forming on the beetle's shell, and just before the sun comes up, it tips its shell up, the water runs down to its mouth, it has a good drink and goes off and hides for the rest of the day. And the ingenuity, if you could call it that, goes even further because on the back of the beetle's shell, there are a whole series of little bumps. 
And those bumps are hydrophilic, they attract water. And between them, there's a waxy finish which repels water. And the effect of this is that as the droplets of water form on those bumps, they stay in very tight spherical form, which, which means that it's much more mobile than it would be if it was just a mist of water over the whole beetle's shell. So even when there's only a small amount of moisture in the air, it's still able to harvest that very efficiently and channel it down to its mouth. And um, to explain how we applied those ideas to this project, uh, sorry, um, this um, animation just shows some comparative uh, temperatures. So let's just say that the, um, the temperature of the desert at night is about 30 degrees C. Uh, the temperature of outer space is minus 273 degrees C. And um, what you can do on a clear night is you can, you can get a matte black surface to radiate heat out to outer space. And this is how the ancient Persians made ice thousands of years ago. They would put down a bed of straw, uh, and then last thing at night, they would put a shallow ceramic tray on that with a black glaze and a thin layer of water. And on a clear night, that was enough to, uh, that radiative effect was enough to form ice. So our um, project includes a greenhouse inspired by these ideas. And what we do during the day is we bring seawater into the growing space and we evaporate it into that growing space to make it cool and humid. And then at night, we drop the lower layer of the roof of this greenhouse and we still bring seawater into that, but we're now we're evaporating it into the roof space. And then we have a high emissivity surface, just like the beetle's shell, which uh, emits heat and forms a condensation surface so that we can condense some of that uh, humidity and uh, form uh, distilled water, which we can use to, to water the plants. And one of the uh, key principles of biomimicry is to look for um, uh, symbiotic ways of bringing technologies together. So we looked around for other technologies that could work well with the greenhouse, and this is the one we settled on. It's called Concentrated Solar Power, or CSP, and it uses mirrors to focus the sun's heat to create electricity. And this CSP and our greenhouse have some very interesting synergies. Firstly, both technologies work very well in hot, sunny deserts. Secondly, CSP benefits from seawater cooling. It can be as much as 10% uh, more productive and we can make use of all that waste heat to evaporate more water and potentially create more fresh water in the greenhouses. I'm getting quite a lot of background noise at the moment. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, and this is a further synergy. Uh, the shade created by the mirrors makes it possible to grow a whole range of crops that would not grow in desert regions normally, simply because the intensity of the heat is too much. So our proposal was to uh, create this long hedge of, of greenhouses uh, facing the prevailing wind with concentrated solar power plants at intervals along the way. And then this is how it would look at a large scale. So we have the saltwater called greenhouses. We have crops growing inside. These are the concentrated solar power plants. Uh, there would uh, also be crops growing under these mirrors. And here we're trying to push back the boundaries of the desert. And that's where we were about six years ago. And then we managed to get funding uh, to carry out feasibility studies in Jordan and Qatar. And that was an opportunity to look at a whole range of other technologies that we could bring into this synergistic cluster. So we looked at examples like uh, algae for biofuels, we looked at halophytes. These are crops that can grow directly in seawater and produce food and fodder. And we looked at uh, ways of evaporating more of the moisture out of the brine that comes out of the greenhouse to help us with uh, the desert revegetation. And in many ways, this was a bit like a plumbing exercise in which we took all these technologies and looked at them in terms of their inputs and outputs. And then following ecosystem models, what we tried to do is to make all of those outputs uh, become inputs for something else in the system. 
and overall it looks like this. Don't try and read all that. That's just to give a sense of the interconnections uh, within this system. And in simple terms, we're using what we have a lot of, sunlight, seawater, and carbon dioxide, to produce more of what we need, food, fodder, electricity, materials, oxygen, and, and so on. And we built the first version of this in Qatar. Uh, this was opened during the climate change talks by the Emir of Qatar in 2012. And this was an opportunity for us to uh, test all the main elements of the system. We had concentrated solar power. This is the saltwater called greenhouse. Uh, we had photovoltaic system here. This is algae for biofuels. Uh, this is uh, using the evaporator hedges uh, for revegetation technologies. And at the back, we have the salt ponds that would uh, dry the salt out to, to dry salts and allow us to reclaim some very interesting materials and compounds. And, and uh, next, we're uh, going to be building in, in Jordan. Uh, so here, the Arava Valley has uh, probably the best conditions for our project. It's got a very hot, dry wind that blows off the land. And it's also an ideal location in terms of geopolitics, uh, because we often think of Jordan as being uh, like a sort of haven of peace with some quite difficult neighbors. But in truth, it's a very precarious situation. Uh, Jordan is one of the most water poor countries in the world. It imports quite a lot of its food. It imports 95% of its energy. It's got a growing population, uh, which has recently be, been swelled uh, with um, refugees from the war in Syria. So it would be very easy for that situation to become unstable. And what we're hoping is that if our project uh, gets scaled up in Jordan, then it could make a really positive contribution to uh, food, water, and energy security in, in that region. And now, uh, drawing together uh, some of the, the key points from what I've been saying, I think biomimicry is simply one of the best sources of ideas to help us address the key challenges of, of the coming years. It draws on 3.8 billion years of research and development, 3.8 billion years of uh, brilliant solutions illuminated by previously un unparalleled scientific knowledge, facilitated by previously unimaginable digital design tools, Designers have never had such an opportunity to rethink and design solutions fit for the next billion years. And in the field of lighting design, there are countless examples that you can look at in biology of, of really quite stunning uh, lighting displays. You can find examples of color creation, uh, diffusion, diffraction, f light focusing, uh, e even amazing examples of uh, color and camouflage as with this example. This is a, a squid. So I hope that was of interest.